Good evening, uh, Advocate Fan Asvegan. Good evening, Deputy yeah. Chief How Justice. How are you? I'm fine, and yourself? I'm fine too. I must first apologize uh, for the earlier mishap and thank you for accepting our invitation to join us this afternoon, well, this evening now. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Mm, thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Chief Justice. All right. Uh, you hold a B, a, what is your first degree? A BLC, Baccalaureus Legum Sigvillis, yes. And uh -huh. I then subsequently did an LLB degree. All right. Both at, at the University of Pretoria. That is correct. Right. Uh, you started your legal career as a prosecutor. Yes, I started. In the regional court. Yes, I was, no, initially I started in the district court where everybody starts. So I started uh, prosecuting in December of 1993 and I prosecuted for a period of three years in the Randburg Magistrates Court, initially in the district court and later on the majority of time in the regional court. Mm -hmm. And in 1997 you joined the Yes, it, Society of Advocates. That's correct. It was a passion of mine to always come to the bar. I loved litigating whilst uh, I, I st when I was prosecuted, I realized that I loved litigating. And that is the reason why I then decided to join the uh, Johannesburg Society of Advocates. Mm -hmm. And what kind of practice have you had? I have had a general practice in the sense that I've done commercial work, I've done little, uh, banking law, I've done family law, I've done uh, defamation work, I've done uh, children's court work and curatrix at Latum work. Any criminal work? Uh, initially, yes. In my first few years at the bar, I would say a period of three years, uh, because my the instructing attorneys knew me from prosecuting days, uh, they referred the criminal work to me. So yes, for the initially, for the period of three years, and ever since when the opportunity arose, when there was a fraud or a theft case, um, and it was uh, one of my civil attorneys, they would brief me in the matter and I would appear in the, the uh, criminal matter as well. You have acted in the Gauteng Division of the High Court, not so? Yes, indeed, sir. Uh, how many stints, acting stints have you had? I've had... And, and when? Yes, uh, the first acting stint was in uh, July of 2019, and subsequently I've had an acting stint for four weeks, also in uh, this year, in uh, July of 2022. Totaling uh, five weeks, indeed. F five weeks. That's correct. I see. Uh, did you manage to write any judgment during that brief period? Yes, I did How write many? judgments. I've included that in my curriculum vita. Your, um, it is next to the papers under section eight. Uh, I've written the judgment of Ramatuduana Investments and City of Joburg Property Company, CC. I also wrote Melomet versus Helivac and Randwater versus Urban Dynamics. And since then, uh, during this last stint, I had uh, several uh, matters, uh, 14 matters, in which I gave some summary judgments, I gave extempore judgments, and in the uh, more intricate matters, I wrote judgments as well. And uh, you reckon that this uh, period suffices, suffice to prepare you for permanent appointment? Um, I know that if one has regards to uh, the uh, references uh, by the legal bodies, uh, they, they say that I lack experience. However, I'm here to persuade you that that is not uh, the situation. Um, although it is so, 
that I have only acted for a period of five weeks, experience does not equal a competence. I'm a competent uh, advocate. I've had a successful practice for 25 years. I started out that practice in 1997. I built that practice despite many uh, disadvantages that came my way, and I've built the practice till where it is today. Uh, I can also indicate to you that my practice has been a court-going uh, practice. So what I mean by that is that I spent the majority of my time in court. I spent two to three days a week in court. Um, and as any pupil at any bar will tell you, that the, the, the place where you learn the most about court is in court. I see the interaction between judges as well as advocates. And whether you sit behind the bench or in front of the bench, the law that you apply is exactly the same. I also do believe that you might find a, a, a person that's been appointed and has been appointed for 15 years that merely does the work from day to day, whereas a, a person that might be uh, appointed has the energy, the transformation, the initiative to be like a new broom and really cleans. Did you struggle at all with the workload and the, the pace one is expected to work at in that division? I will say no. I say so due to the following reasons. Um, I was uh, under Judge Valley, who was the senior judge in the post-motion court whilst I acted. I was given 12 matters. Uh, he phoned me and indicated whether I was prepared to also deal with two additional matters. And I was willing and prepared to accept those matters. And I, I sat long hours, but I did uh, finish that particular role. I was also uh, fortunate to be in the urgent court with Judge Mayer Frawley, and both her and myself uh, were indeed uh, um, uh, or, or we could cope with the workload that came our way whilst we were in urgent court. You don't owe the division any reserve judgments? Pardon me? Do you have any reserve judgments? No, I don't have any reserve judgments, except I must add that I appeared in a, a, a full bench at trial a appeal with Judge Matajani and Judge Keatley, and there's still a full bench appeal a judgment that is outstanding. Uh, but pertaining to that judgment, as I understand it, I'm busy doing a draft, and I've done a, 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 a draft note, and those draft notes will be handed to Judge Matajani, who will be the, 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 the scribe at the end of the day. So that is the only one that has not been written. When was that matter heard? It was heard in um, July. Mm -hmm. It must have been around about the 22nd. All right. And the one um, was it an application? The, the one application for leave to appeal against your judgment yes. was dismissed uh, by yeah. the SCA. Yes, it was mm. dismissed by the SCA. All right. Uh, uh, J.P. Mlambo, do you have questions for your candidate? Th thank you, DCJ. Good evening, Advocate Van der Zwerch. Good evening, J.P. Um, let me start by thanking you for doing work in the pro bono court. It's a pleasure, J.P. Because uh, the assistance we get from advocates who come to do work pro bono, as you would have seen, uh, helps the judges deal with the workload, normal workload of the division. I understand. So when you guys come to offer your services free of charge, it helps them deal with the work of the division and it helps us not accumulate backlogs. Yes. So yes. thank you very much for that. Yes, yes. And uh, um, you've already told the DCJ you've acted for five weeks. Yes, indeed, sir. And uh, one of those weeks was in the urgent court. Yes, it was right. indeed. Um, are you able to tell the commission how many matters you had in that week, just as an individual? Because it's a busy court. Yes, it is a busy court. I don't want to lie. It must have been, I suppose, anything between maybe 20, 25. 
that, that the norm is 30 per judge in a busy agent court week. Yes. So you would have got between 20 and 25 yourself. Yes. Aside from what That's judge correct, my friend judge. got. Yeah. That's correct. And uh, how many judgments out of those did you write or did you deal with them extempore? What I did is the majority I did extempore, but there was one judgment which I reserved and uh, gave on uh, the uh, Tuesday following uh, the uh, Friday when the matter was heard. Yes, yes. And uh, I, I must say what's remarkable about you, your acting stint is you've given us a list of 25 judges, uh, f judgments. Yes, ju judgments. Out of an acting stint of five weeks. Yes. That's quite remarkable. Um, Thank you, JP. Yeah. Now, um, you've not had the opportunity to sit for a full term. No. That is, do everything that a judge does in a term. You've not. No, I have not. And uh, uh, it may be an unfair question to ask you. Without that experience, uh, would you consider yourself that you are ready, even if you haven't acted for a full term? Judge President, as I said, mm. um, that experience does not equate to competence. Yes. As an advocate practicing at the Johannesburg Bar, what I've done is time management is a skill that you early on learn in your practice. And that is a skill that I possess. I also possess the skills of being meticulous, I'm hard working, I'm full of uh, energy, I'm wanting to do this, and um, I don't believe uh, that a person that has all those skills will not be able to cope with the demands. I have had experience in commercial work, I have also had experience in criminal work. Myself, I did not sit in the civil trial courts, but I did do civil actions and I did appear in those matters. So according to me, I will be able to cope with the load. I know it's a very, very busy division, and JP, you don't want a machine that's not uh, oiled well. And obviously you want all the parts to be functioning optimal. I will be a part that will be functional, functioning optimal. Uh, I do believe that if you've got time management uh, skills and you are willing and able and you're perfectionist like I am, that you will be able to cope, JP. Yeah. No, thank you for that, that assurance. Um, uh, and then I just want to go to the judgments uh, you've listed. Yes. You got an email yesterday that you'll be asked questions about one of those judgments. Yes, I, I saw it this morning. Yes, JP, I did, did, did receive that. I see, though, that it's listed in your list. I thought it's still pending. I don't want you to name the parties, but I see yes. it's uh, listed as number 23 Judge President, in your list. Uh, it concerned me because of the fact if, you'll, uh, if you have the judgment in front of you, 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 you would note that it's heading notes on appeal. So, yes. so it's not a final, it's a work in progress. I see. Because um, that's my understanding. That's why I don't want you to discuss the, yes. mer the merits. Yes, and the parties don't know uh, yes. what, what the outcome is yeah. as of yet, no. But the reason I want to ask you questions about it is one of the reasons we put new acting judges in appeals yes, judge. with permanent judges yes. is for them to give me feedback yes. about how they've ex experienced the new acting judge. Yes. Right. Now, there was a discussion between you and the two judges, or with Judge Matojani, Indeed, after sir. you sent him your notes. Because Indeed, sir. my report is that you the scribe. It's your judgment that they've allocated you to write. And you sent a note. I don't know if that's correct. Indeed, so I sent a note. Uh, JP, I, they, there must be some misunderstanding because initially, um, Judge Motijani said that you would be writing the, the uh, judgment. Yeah. And then I offered, and, and I, I do believe that I think that in uh, full bench uh, judgments, the senior judge mostly writes the judgment. Yeah. However, I offered to write it, and he, he, ex he was so, so uh, uh, he actually indicated to me that he was willing 
to let me write the judgment. I then said to him that I would send him the notes, and as you say, see, it's notes on appeal. So obviously I needed to be guided by him as a senior and more experienced uh, person than I am. Yeah, but I would like you to share with the commission the discussion you had with him yes. when he received your note. When he received my note, yeah. uh, well, well, he sent me an email in which he, um, I, I just uh, took that down from where he w was. He enjoyed reading my comprehensive and well reasoned heads. What I did is I combined the heads of argument and I also set out the facts in the notes on appeal. He indicated to me that uh, he wanted me to have regards to, for instance, Judge Plaskett and uh, Judge Unteralter and the way that they do their judgments and that I, in my judgments, uh, have footnotes, whereas uh, he, uh, it seems, preferred not to, to, to have the footnotes. Um, I then indicated to him that I was more than willing to, to go and have regards to those judgments to see how I could better uh, my judgment writing. I must indicate to you that judgment writing, in my opinion, is something very personal. It, it depends on your personality. And I have gone and I have checked, and even the, in the SCA, I see they do make notes, use of footnotes. So, so I think it's a personal preference, but it's something that I'm willing to learn. And I think that I've, I've heard uh, other um, judges that are experienced judges that appeared in front of this panel who indicated that even they have uh, 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 still to learn about uh, judgment writing. Yeah. I think what I want to ask you, you, you mentioned it a bit, that he, he, in fact, you mentioned yourself that you combined yes. the heads of arguments. That's correct. Of both parties. That's correct. And then uh, composed your judgment note on yes. that basis. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. That's what I wanted to, to clear with you, because yes. that's the report I got. That's correct. That you took the heads from this side and this side and you compiled your note. Indeed, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, DCJ. JP, uh, MEC, you covered. Commissioner Lopez. In fact, the, the first question is a follow-up yes. uh, to this debate with the JP. Full, is it not the full bench judgment yes. that you have said is judgment to China who's writing? But now you seem to have said Well, I described. think that they must... No, no, no. What, what I said, and I must indicate that very clearly, is initially his uh, Judge Matijani indicated that he was going to... And then I offered, and I think uh, maybe out of place offered as an acting judge to write it. Um, he then indicated that he was willing for me to write it, but as I understood it, I would, I would do a draft, and he would then uh, add to that draft. So that we clear this one, put aside. Are you describing that full bench judgment? Well, I've, uh, if, I say the, if you say the scrub, yes, I've scrubbed, but it's notes. <laughs> It's not, at this, it's not a, a judgment at this point in time. It right. is a working process. All right. Now, <clears throat> in a criminal trial, yes. is it permissible in the evaluation of evidence to apply probabilities? For me to apply? In a criminal trial, yes. when, as a judge, you are doing the evaluation of evidence, is it permissible to apply probabilities in respect of that evidence that we have to okay. determine one side of, of no, the measure. No, it's a civil uh, measure uh, that you use on probabilities. You'll be, uh, work on reasonable doubt, beyond reasonable doubt. So you can't apply probabilities? No, that you is, can't. Like you, you consider the evidence as a whole, put evidence as a whole, you analyze the evidence, yes. and in the process, yes. in respect, you can't apply the probabilities. No, you'll look at what is beyond a reasonable doubt. All right. Then my second question is, in a, tri in a trial where the defendant bears the onus 
it turns out at the end that both witnesses for the defendant and the plaintiff yes. were inherently poor. Yes. But on probabilities, um, still the case favors, probabilities favors the, the plaintiff. Yes. What should be your response? What would be your response? What the, it favors the plaintiff, yes. you say. Yeah. The, then uh, if the probabilities favor the plaintiff, then in a civil case, uh, the, the matter will be in favor of the plaintiff. Okay. Um, I think I'm not too sure uh, uh, to see whether I can ask this just the last question. One um, last one, short. It's short, no, I'm trying to be specific <laughs> my question. And then, right. Um, The, uh, um, in the constitution of the court, that is a criminal court, yes. where the section, for instance, prescribes for the presence of assessors, yes. it turns out that uh, one of the assessors is not available. Yes. Is the court entitled to proceed with the trial? in circumstances where the accused had called for the presence of those assessors. If there's only two assessors there, available. There are two assessors in the, in the initial, but one of them just become unavailable before the trial starts. Yes, I believe that the court will be entitled if there are two other assessors still available. No, no, if what I'm saying, there's one of the assessors become not available. Yes. You are left with one. Uh, only one. One, yes. yes. That is a very good. Is the court entitled to proceed with that trial? And the, can I just understand rightly? So the accused wanted it to proceed with assessors. No, no. What I'm saying is the accused elected that for the presence of assessors during the trial. Yes. And in terms of the act. The assessors may, should be two. Now one of them becomes yes, unavailable. Yes. I understand. And there are delays, there are delays. Is the court entitled to proceed in the absence of that assessor who's simply not available? I understand your question. Thank you for clearing that up to me. I will not, as a judge, then proceed. Uh, I will uh, rather see to it that there's two assessors so that that uh, accused get a fair and reasonable trial. Commission, Commissioner Prof. Yes, you yeah. Prof. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chief, Chief Justice. Good, good evening, Judge. Good evening, Commissioner. Um, you, you wrote a very interesting case, uh, NetBank versus Msizi that it was a foreclosure case. Yes. You remember it? Which I wrote. dealing with uh, property that was executed and... Yes, ex executability. Now you might just have to, because you, I do lots of, yeah. of those. Is it a judgment? It's a fourth, four foreclosure case. Um, Is it one that I wrote? Yes. Yes. You, you remember it? No, maybe you'll not just me. have okay. to... Let, let me not deal with, because I can see that you don't have your, your, your laptop there, so perhaps maybe you may not be able to engage the fact, because I wanted to, to deal with the fact. Yes. But let me deal with it quite broadly, yes. just to be fair to, to, to you. Please. Um, the, this case dealt with Rule 46A of the Uniform Rules of Court, which was yes. recently amended, and the regulations that came, that came through. Yes. Um, in relation to the setting of prices, uh, when reserved prices, when the, the property is, is declared executable. Yes. Um, I just want to, to understand whether the law is quite clear or whether the law is, um, it is at the stage where people whose houses are executed upon can actually get some, some protection particularly when the price are reserved and then the sheriff has to execute, but the property cannot be sold because the, the market value cannot actually be, be had. And you find Very that rich. the banks have to come to court to, to request the court to reduce the price. Yes. Um, in that process, 
do you do you have any view as to how should um, we deal with these issues to protect the debtor's rights? Because if the price is reduced, uh, you'll find that the debtors will still have to do the outstanding amount uh, once the, the property has been, has been sold. How can we protect debtors? In other words, is Rule 43A adequate in its current formation to protect the debtors, especially when the sheriffs are unable to sell the price at the market value that has been prescribed? or the reserve price that has been set? That is a very fair question, Commissioner. Commissioner, I don't believe that Rule 46A gives the debtor uh, the current protection that they need. I say this in lieu of the fact that if one sees how courts uh, com uh, compute the reserve price, um, yes, they make use of the market value, the municipal value, they'll make use of, of sometimes the lifespan evaluations that are given. And you will find that uh, advocates would stand up and uh, uh, one advocate would say, I use this formula. Another advocate would say, I use another formula. And often, I do these matters as an advocate, so often uh, the bank will send, send you a brief and you'll, you'll find that when you calculate the reserve price, even your calculation differs from that so what I believe needs to be done is say for the fact that we get the market and municipal value is maybe for the actuaries on the bank side to come forward and to compare because they the experts. We as, as, as ju 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 jurists aren't the, the, the uh, experts in the field, but that they compute a specific formula based upon which we can calculate uh, this reserve price. And I think that if that is an actuarial con uh, uh, computation, then a debtor will not be able to come and say that it's not a reasonable, because then it will be reasonable. But as long as advocates and as long as the bench need to, to try and get a, a reserve price between the market and the municipal value, I believe that one will never, never, uh, you may be lucky, in that you set a, re a reserve price that is reasonable. But I do believe that if the actuaries, and not even of the bank, uh, one, one can have independent actuaries, even if I think about it now, I would rather have an independent actuary compute. Uh, why can that not be done? And then I think we'll have a formula that, that would be a reasonable and effective formula for any data. Yes, and in, in, in the judgment, you, you, you go to, to the extent of a market value. I'm not really, I, I think that is right, and I'm not really concerned with that. Let's say the, the formula, you, you reach it and everything is fine and the reserve price is agreed upon. Yes. My, my main issue is in relation to when the sheriff cannot actually sell the, the, the property on the amount that has been agreed upon. Yes. And then the bank has to come back to court and request the court to reduce the amount so that they actually can, 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 can sell the property. And of course, the implications on the debt. I'm just, I'm just looking at the, uh, at, the, at, at the person who owes the bank. Can, How can we protect this person? Commissioner, um, that is why I say, if we've got an actuarial calculation that is done the first time around by the legal practitioner, so if we've got that formula and we can compute that, then a reserve price would be set and the, the, the sheriff will be then able to, if the market is obviously, because the market prices will obviously also fluctuate. And that is why I say that an actuarial, is, it, it is something that the actuarial science uh, experts will need to compute. Otherwise, unfortunately, debtors will have to, or, or rather the bank will have to come back to the detriment of the debtor who will then have to uh, pay the additional cost. Okay. No, thank you very much, DCJ. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner uh, Thank you very much, uh, DCJ, and uh, good evening, uh, Advocate Van Asvechen. Yes, Commissioner. Good uh, evening uh, to you. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm fine yourself. Uh, thank you so much. I'm glad. You see, Advocate, you've received comments from the law bodies. Yes. Uh, the PLA, the GCP, 
yes. the Law Society and Nadel, they all indicate that you lack experience as an, as an acting judge. Yes. And that um, you may benefit um, from further uh, acting uh, experience. Uh, suggesting that it may be premature uh, to nominate, nominate you to, to the bench. And um, what, what is your comment? Uh, Commissioner, I wish to reiterate that experience does not equate to competence. I believe I'm competent. I've had 25 years of experience. I'm almost daily in court. I see the interactions between advocates, attorneys, and the bench. And I do believe that those interactions, if you ask any pupil advocate, what is the training ground for a newly appointed uh, or a newly uh, appointed advocate, it is the court. And that is, uh, the court to me is a second home. It is a place where I litigate, uh, litigation is in my blood, and I, therefore I do not believe that because of the fact that I did not sit behind the bench, I, I stood be in front of the bench, I argued matters, but that does not mean that I'm ignorant of what's happening. I must also indicate to you that you have, would have seen from our curriculum vita that even at a stage when I didn't even think of coming to the bench when I was much younger, I attended two aspirant judges' courses. One was at Lily's Leave, and the other one was in Kempton Park at Earl Tumbo. I, I don't recall the hotel's name. But I attended those courses in order for me to, to come to realization about what it is that judges want and require. And in order to better myself, I do believe that those aspirant judges' causes also uh, in, help me in, in, in becoming an, uh, an, an adds to the fact that I only have five uh, weeks of acting stint uh, experience. Uh, <clears throat> do you want me to... Um, read into your statement or your response that you are not attaching uh, any value to uh, acting stints? No, not at all. Oh, sorry, let me put it that acting stints are not adding any value to people gaining uh, experience. No. No, not at all. I think acting stints are very, very valuable. Um, I do think, and, and maybe if I can give my view on that, I, I've had acting stints, and I've been fortunate to be in the Gauteng Local Division under J.P. Malambu, uh, where the uh, judges were, were really helpful. Uh, they wanted to assist us to make us better uh, aspirant, I can say, judges. However, what I think is needed is like that maybe there should be a more formal structure because people come and go doing acting stints and as myself being a, a practicing advocate uh, I can afford four weeks at a time to act. You must realize that I've got uh, instructing attorneys, long-standing attorneys that I service. I had to to, uh, to pertaining to that, in order to, to be able to act, you have to make certain sacrifices. And um, I, I, I just think that if there is like, like almost like a pupillage program where there's an acting uh, judges type of program, I know that there's the aspirant judges program over weekends. I don't know whether it's longer now. But where, where there's also maybe a structure where an acting judge can go before uh, or, or, or uh, uh, do mentorship type of thing under a senior judge and can be evaluated by that senior judge over a period of time. That might also be a, a good initiative to, be, to think of. I'm just thinking of ways because I think that every, uh, every candidate that sat here today did acting stints. And I don't think whether you sat 50 weeks makes you a better 
uh, judge necessarily as a person like myself that only sat there for five weeks. It depends on your experience, it depends on your personality, whether you wish, you wish to transform, whether you want to show initiative, all these things come into play. So I do believe that it all adds up. So you are suggesting that in the period that you acted in that court, uh, you never struggled? No, I don't think you can say that you never struggled. Uh, I didn't struggle. Uh, I've, I've got help from um, uh, the colleagues who were then the judges. And uh, no, I, I never struggled. I, yes, uh, with the workload, you have to sit long and hard hours. You have to put that in. So if that is part of the struggle, yes. I don't think any judge can say in this division that you don't struggle. You do. Thank you so much, Advocate. Thank, Thank you, you Commissioner. Much. Any questions from the Commissioners on the virtual platform? Yes, I have a question. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Bernard. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'd like to um, just ask you about the, the, the notes that were referred to that you that I'm still not, I'm not sure whether that was actually then a draft judgment of sorts, or was it it's, it's something that well, it's totally a, discarded? Uh, maybe I can just I apologize. Is, oh, oh, I see you're in front of me. Sorry. Um, just, just to answer your question, a few nights ago, I saw Judge Mayer sat here, and he actually spoke about judgment writing, and Judge Matopu, who indicated the following, he said the following pertaining to judgment writing, and that, for me, sums up judgment writing. He says, you look at all the facts that you've got, you do... Uh, sorry, 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 no, no, uh, that's not my question. My question is, is, are the notes that were submitted, are they, um, are they a, a draft judgment, even though it's just the first, the very early draft? That yes, it's an early draft. It's a work in progress. So I, I, I won't say it's notes to a judgment, yes. I, I'm a little bit concerned about just the reproducing of heads of argument. You see, there's this, um, are you familiar with the Stratford Stores versus Salt of the Earth Constitutional Court judgment? Yes, I am. Where the court frowned upon just um, sort of regurgitating heads of argument and said it has to be done in, in your own words. I think in that matter, there was heads of arguments copied and a couple of lines of own notes added to the judgment and the court said that's, that's just not how it should be done. Uh, are you familiar with that? Yes, can I just answer to that? I don't think that it is fair to ask of me to comment on notes on a judgment compared to a judgment. If it was a judgment, then it is fair to ask that question of me and then to compare it to the state of its matter. This is not a final judgment. It has not even been given. Um, in this division, there is a three-month period. Uh, I'm working with senior uh, uh, colleagues in my division to finalise uh, those heads of argument. So, no, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not a judgment. What was the, the judge that you gave it to, Judge Matajani? What was he supposed to do with these notes? Well, the, the judges obviously give their comments, and I can refer you to my email to him, which specifically states that it's notes and that I await their input in, the, in respect of, of um, if I may just go there. Um, I, I actually commented the following, and I wish to read it to you. I've combined both parties' heads on the three relevant points argued, and will put them in judgment format. I thank uh, Kyukhaile for his valuable pointers on judgment writing. Please, however, bear with me. So that was what I wrote to Judge uh, Matujani. Yes, I think it's that line where you've combined both sets of heads of argument and will put them in judgment, in judgment. format. Yes. That, 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 that bothers me slightly in the light of the um, authority that I've referred to, the state of its stores matter, but 
Uh, we can leave it at that. Just uh, I'd to, like uh, to just answer you, Commissioner. Uh, in any uh, judge, when you, when you uh, compile a judgment, you'll look at the heads of argument. And for me to crystallize these facts, I, I need to look at these heads of argument, and I have to work with them. So I do not think that there's any judge in, uh, in any division that do not work with the heads of argument. No, it's, it's not a matter of not working with it. I mean, obviously, they, they have to be taken, they be regarded seriously, but a judgment should always be in your own words. But I think you've answered it. Thank you very much. Thank that's, you. That, that's my question. Thank you very much. Follow up, DCJ. Follow up. Just one question from me, David Chief Justice, if I may. There's a follow up question, but I can't make out. Oh. <laughs> No, no, thank you very much, DCJ. Um, I just want to, to correct one mistake that I made. Uh, the, the, ju the judgment that I spoke to the candidate with, I said he, she wrote it and she did not write it. She was actually a, a, an advocate on that judgment. I just wanted to clarify that. But she didn't correct you, though. <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, yes, uh, Commissioner Singh? Yes, thank you very much. Good evening, uh, Advocate. I think the last question for the evening. Uh, would you consider the justice system as having done enough to reform or transform the current level of women representation within the system? And here yeah, I also refer to race as well. What would your view be on that question? Thank you. No, I don't think that enough has been done. Uh, if one has regard at the skewed briefing patterns and the fact that um, I think they, so, there must be something seriously done in respect of briefing, briefing patterns, especially for juniors uh, beyond five years, um, it's irrespective of the right, then specifically the disadvantaged uh, juniors as well as, uh, as the women at the bar, for instance, and to, so that those people also get the benefit of, of the commercial work. I myself can speak from experience in this sorry, in the sense that when I started at the bar, you initially got low profile uh, matters and that even the, the, uh, the male colleagues that did uh, pupillage with me seemed to be getting uh, better commercial work than I was actually getting. Uh, however, uh, times are now changing and things are a bit different in that we've got the second and third advocate rule where you'll see that uh, women and uh, black uh, advocates do appear. However, I would love to see that these second and third advocates also give their, uh, their arguments in court. And sometimes in all these great uh, matters uh, that you see on television, you'll see that the people that participate are merely men. And, and I do think that there is a definite need uh, for, uh, for transformation in that respect. Uh, just as a follow-up, I think these are legitimate concerns that you raise generally. But coming back home to yourself, yes. what opportunities have you provided? Uh, for black advocates and juniors to, to join you in matters that you uh, were briefed on? Well, I was a mentor to three uh, uh, disadvantaged uh, uh, female advocates at the bar. Uh, advocate Sonomta Linda, Advocate Amy uh, Rawani Mosali, as well as Advocate uh, Sylvia Polu, who at the time that the, the latter did pupillage was even pregnant. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, very proud of these three women. Two of them are now in highly successful uh, uh, commercial uh, 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 um, jobs, and the, the latter one is just now starting out, but th they are some of my greatest achievements. Say for that, you would also see one of my recommend or nominations was by an advocate, Emmanuel Sitoli, and I, myself, do always provide ex my experience and skills to the people that need it. You would see that even whilst uh, he did not do pupillage with me, that I was able and willing to take him to court and introduce him to motion court so that he can also have the love that I've got for it. 
Thank you, Advocate. Thank you, Deputy Chief Justice. Thank you. Commissioner Varun. Good evening, Ms. Ms. Van Asvetlin. Good evening, yes. Commissioner. Um, in, your, in your bundle of documents, at page 31, you list, yes. you give us a list of the, I think, significant cases. Yes. Um, the, the, just hold on, let me get there, 31. And you've listed a number of cases there. And I'm, I'm struggling to, to understand what it is that you are conveying here, because the heading is key cases involved in as an advocate. And you have the first case, which is a class action. That's your listeresis matter. Yes. Where you say you appeared. Yes. And then the next one is the hair hold versus Wills. Yes. You now say contributed to the establishment. I, I don't know what that means. Uh, whether you appeared, you, I argued, appeared. you argued, what did you do? Yes. Okay. Um, and when you say you contributed, what do you mean? You argued successfully and so established law. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thanks for that matter, uh, um, uh, and specifically that question. Uh, pertaining to those uh, key, um, I think I, I, I wrote uh, in my, they, they, they are key cases that I was involved in. That is the heading as an advocate. The one being the class action. I was so fortunate to be part of uh, where an instructing attorney uh, briefed me as a junior with Advocate Mandel SC in the Listerosis matter, where what we argued is the subpoena ducis tecum, um, that they wanted to compel us uh, to comply with, that we actually brought an application to set that subpoena ducis tecum uh, uh, aside. Uh, we actually, uh, the High Court then uh, dismissed our application. We took it to the SCA and we were successful okay. at the SCA. So if I say we, uh, then I was a junior in that specific matter to Advocate uh, Tony Mandel. Uh, then the landmark online defamation case, uh, I think uh, it is evident if one goes to the uh, uh, internet as well and to Google that the Harold versus Wills matter is the first matter that deals with defamation and also on the social network and specifically Facebook. I was one of the advocates that in that matter uh, uh, researched defamation and social media and at that point in time they were not any um, uh, uh, matters in South Africa that dealt with this specific. So we had to look at Canadian law as well as Australian law, which we did. And his lordship, Mr. Justice Willis, as he was then, uh, thanked us for our contribution in that respect. Then I so, also... You know, before, before, before you move I uh, apologize. On. Yes. You see, my, my, I was trying to understand what do you mean you contributed. Yes. Um, can, I, can I just maybe just to you know, to cut through through this. The, you, were, you were for the respondent in this application. Yes. And you, your client was not successful in the application. No. All right. That's, I, I just wanted to check that about it because my reading of you, of this list was it's matters where you are. You, you no, it's key the uh, cases that I were okay. involved in. So uh, the class we, action we, we were oh, successful. No, Yes. I apologize. Okay, please, please work with me. I'm yes, sorry. Work I apologize. Yes. And then the next one, you have Standard Bank of SA versus Rami and another. Yes. And you say you convinced the court to come to a different finding in respect of the amended Rule 32 procedural and practical effect. This is summary judgment, right? That's correct. And then you say Rule 32 was not retrospective in its operation. I. I have read that judgment. Yes. I think, as I understand it, and please correct me, you, your client was not successful in this application, and, and I don't see, in my reading of it, I don't see that you convinced the court, because in fact, I think, that, as I understand it, the court found the other way. No, my client was successful, and uh, her ladyship, Mrs. Justice Sir Wendy, found in favor of my client. Uh, the sure? argument that w was held was there was a previous decision in the same division 
um, which stated that the Rule 32 rule uh, was retrospective. And uh, she then asked myself, I think it was Advocate Adams, and I cannot recall the third person, uh, to argue uh, our client's cases, and we were indeed successful. All right. Maybe I, mis I misread it. You see, the first paragraph says, this application for summary judgment served before me on 29 August. I reserve judgment for submissions regarding the retrospective effect, right? Yes. And whether it was competent for a court to entertain the application, and you were asked to make submissions, uh, and then she says, I've determined that it is. So you say that it is retrospective. No, it's not. All right, I, I read it, I think we read it differently. Maybe. Yes, we read it differently. It was not retrospective. Uh, there was a previous uh, judgment. I do not recall. Uh, the, 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 judge, the judge says, I have determined that it is. It is not, res not it was not retrospective. Okay. All right, let me, I, I read it differently, I must tell you. I, I, I read it the opposite of how you read it. But let me go into my next judgment, which is the last one. It's the, you've referred to the matter of hair hold. Uh, so hold on, let me go there. This is Pilot Fright. Uh, no, I think yours is hair hold versus Wills. Yes, Wills versus hair. Say that again. Herald versus Wills. Yes, that's one of the judgments, am I correct? That's correct. Uh, just bear with me, DCJ, if you would bear with me. And in this matter you appeared, you say, what do you say about it? You say in your, in your application, what do you say about it? Well, the application was my client was the one that uh, uh, was, uh, up, uh, the, the court found against oh, no, my no, no. client. I do, I do apologize, you've answered that. In fact, I wanted to ask you a different one, my last one. I do apologize, it's the hour of the day. You referred to Pilot Fright versus von Landsberg. That's the one I wanted to ask you about. And you say court came to the finding that non-compliance with Section 346 of the Companies Act, this is a winding up application. Yes. Again, uh, and you were for the, res for the, for the applicant, yeah? Yes. And the applicant was unsuccessful. Yes, uh, what, we, what happened in that matter, there was not, uh, the judge wanted uh, compliance by not the uh, legal representative, mm -hmm. but by the uh, people that then served, whether it be the sheriff or uh, who served on the master specifically. Can, can I tell you why I'm taking you through these? It's yes. because my, you, you've listed these cases, and you start with the listeriosis case, where yes. you were successful. Yes. And then it's followed by a list of cases. You do not say you were successful. You do not say you were unsuccessful. You actually use neutral language. And, and, I, and, and I, I have to put this to you, that when I read these, I, I understood them in the same vein as how you have dealt with the Listeriosis case. You appeared in these matters and you were successful and you contributed to making law in these cases. But in fact, in the rest of them, that is not the case. Your, your clients were not successful in these applications. So whatever law was created was not because, if it was, in fact, I don't think any one of them creates new law, but none of them was your contribution because your, your case was not upheld. Uh, Commissioner, if I may answer that, uh, this is part of my curriculum vitae that you're now referring to. It's under the heading key cases involved in as an advocate. I did not only mention the matters that I was, so it doesn't say only matters that I was successful in as. I do believe that in the defamation case I contributed because uh, many of the uh, findings that were made were based on the research that I did as an advocate. Advocate. Uh, pertaining to uh, the so your, own, your own, so your own research was used against you because you lost in the defamation case. Well, sometimes you have to even, to your detriment, point out what what is the case law in a different country. So, so as I say, so a, a, whether you an advocate, it's not always that you, you your 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 case is in your favour. So, if it is adverse to you, that must also be pointed out. Thank you, Mrs. Waffen. Thank you, DCJ. We have reached the end of your interview. 
Ms. Thank you. Asbergen. Thanks again for coming here. Thank you very despite much. Despite everything. Thank you much. You're excused. Thank you very much, Deputy Chief Justice.